Thank you. Thank you so much, and, uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Mayor Dean for the kind introduction. Um, I don't often get introduced by politicians. Uh, <laughs> in Florida, I don't think I can remember. Maybe once it happened, and that was, then they put an end to that. Um, the, uh, I, I was going to just, first of all, start by saying how lucky you all are in Nashville to have a, a leadership. Uh, like Mayor Dean, in, in a city that cares about its library system and, and stands up and fights for its library system. Down in Miami, uh, the, the, the uh, Miami uh, Dade Commission is in the process of uh, uh, gutting the library budget. Uh, and the first, I mean, we, the mayor decided he was going to be a, a budget cutter, and the first he turns his sights on all the libraries in town. So that kind of tells you the priorities for South Florida. And also, why I still write the column that I write uh, after all these years because I can, I can go after those guys and uh, it makes me feel better. I don't know if it does any good, but it ruins their day and that's all I care about. <laughs> um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this novel. I in, sort of came to the, uh, to the writing of uh, kids' novels in a weird way. I, um, I, if you've read any of the grown-up novels, you know that uh, uh, they're fairly twisted, that I'm, I'm not a not a well person, and uh, so I was surpri surprised when I got this call from this editor who said, you want to try writing for kids? And I said, well, you obviously don't have any of your own, or you, would, you wouldn't be asking me that question. And, uh, but then the more I thought about it, and the kids, the kids like funny books, they like irreverence, they like books that sort of bring grown-ups down to size and make fun of grown-ups, and I thought about it, and that's what I've been doing for almost 40 years in the newspaper business is making fun of grown-ups uh, in Florida. So, you know, I thought maybe I could do the transition. And as the mayor said, then I would have a book that I could give to the kids in my own family uh, without being afraid of corrupting them in some way. I got, they, uh, they were all kind of asking. My stepson was 11 when I wrote Hoot, and, and all of them, and the nie nephew and nieces, and I, um, I, they were said they all wanted to know what Uncle Carl did for a living, and could they read? And they would read, you know, the little hands would go up on the book show toward the strip tease or something, and you'd have to slap them away and, and move the book up higher. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the movie came out, and that was the end of that. Um, but uh, so I, I wrote Hoot, sort of as I was going to do only one, and it was a, it, that was that storyline was sort of ripped out of my own childhood, and it was. And I, and I didn't uh, have any trouble as, uh, sort of reverting to the, to the outlook of a, of a young boy, and my wife wasn't surprised at that. She said, You're, you've never really advanced past adolescence anyway, so you shouldn't have any trouble writing from that viewpoint. And I, and I found it pretty easy. I mean, uh, I don't mean the writing is never easy, but I found it uh, easy in the sense it was kind of fun to go back and see the world through those younger eyes. And, uh, and the, the best part was the kids in my family liked the book, and, it, and that's all I cared about. And I was, only, I was going to stop with that one, and then the book did well, and uh, I started getting these letters from young readers. And you got to understand, if you've spent your life in the newspaper world, you do, you do get mail, especially when you write a column in South Florida, and the mail you get is, uh, you, is not something you really look forward to every day. And I, I mean, for instance, I get a lot of prison mail, and uh, I learned a long time ago the hard way um, that you don't respond to prison mail <laughs> because uh, then everyone else on the cell block starts writing you and you have like 10 new best friends all doing 20 to life and they're all innocent uh, and you know, they all want you to write their story. So, but the, and, and then I get the hate mail that comes with in Crayola, big, big letters with the ends, backward ends and things like that from the, you know, from the Panhandle area, and uh, um, so I, I wasn't a big one for opening my mail, although I did. And uh, then I started getting these great letters from kids, and the kids—they're um, just, just wonderful, wise, and funny, and witty, and they were from all over the country, not just from Florida kids. 
And they got the, sort of the message in that book, which was about these little burrowing owls that when I was a kid, uh, we had all over, lived in the ground, and uh, beautiful little animals. And then as, as my neighborhood got developed and paved over, they would, they would just come in and bulldoze the birds and their eggs and the nests and move on. And my friends and I had tried to mount a little vigilante action, and uh, uh, it's all statute of limitations is over now, so I can tell you this, we would take the, when they'd put down the survey stakes and it'd be all around the owl fields, we would just go out and rearrange the survey stakes and, and, just, and do some clever pattern so that then when they come back the next day, these poor dudes, and they're just doing their job, you know, they'd come and they'd start looking and trying to figure out where they were supposed to pour the slab, and of course it looked like some sort of puzzle. And, uh, and they were very confused. And we, and we managed to delay some of it for a while, but eventually they, um, they put security guards out and, we, and uh, they just went ahead and it's now pretty much all concrete. But at the time when you're 10 or 11 years old and you don't understand the politics of, of uh, growth and development, and in the case of South Florida, the, you know, the, the cor there's a, um, corruption is a major influence down there. And, um, we didn't understand any of that. We just thought it was wrong. And it turns out kids everywhere, all over, and, and not just in this country, thought it was wrong. And so I got a lot of mail. And, I, and then the, the letters would always end, when are you writing another book for kids? And so my initial instinct to never write again for kids, um, I just couldn't do it. It was hard to turn my back on that audience. But they were, it was such a, so great. I still get tons of letters uh, from all the kids' books. So. I, uh, when I started this book, um, I had this idea because this character of Skink, who in, in, has been, appeared in several of the grown-up novels, he, and he's not a role model either. He, he's not. Uh, he's, he's a flawed hero in many ways. Um, but he, uh, the adult readers love this character, and, and, and it just shows you how sketchy my fan base is because. Uh, he, he, his backstory is this, he was the governor, he, he came home from Vietnam, uh, he was a decorated war hero, he was persuaded to run for office in Florida, and he, he against his best judgment, decided to do it, he gets elected governor, and, and he, his, he finds he's, um, he's at a, he has a tremendous disadvantage in, in Tallahassee because he's, he's completely honest and he is really the only one up there who's completely honest, and he goes absolutely nuts in office after a couple months, and he just, one day just rips off his clothes and runs out of the governor's mansion and disappears. That's his backstory. Um, again, uh, and oh yeah, and he lives off of roadkill. He, he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't like to waste anything, so he, and we have an abundance of roadkill in Florida. So that's what he, these are all the little things I gave him, and he was only gonna be around in a couple chapters in this first book that I put him in was in 1987, and the book was called Double Whammy, and it was a, a very twisted story. It was about um, sort of murder and corruption and uh, indiscretions on the professional bass fishing tournament. Now, uh, you, you all in the South know about bass fishing tournaments. This book was ahead of its time. I mean, I was, I was sure that, 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 that John Cheever and William Styron, and all the, and, and Philip, everyone were going to come rushing to the bass fishing milieu after my book. It, <laughs> oddly enough, it didn't happen. I'm the only one that's ever written a novel about bass fishing that I know of. Um, but at one point in the course of telling the story, uh, you know, you send this, you send your, you have to send the proposal to New York. And I said, I've got this great little novel. It's about the, you know, all this, this wrongdoing and nefarious behavior but on the professional bass fishing tour. And the editor in New York is like, what, what, is, what is bass fishing? And I said, well, I said, well, if you're from the South, you know, it's just, it's like, a, it's like NASCAR on the water. <laughs> and, and of course, then they, what's, what's NASCAR? So, yeah. so anyway, so, uh, but I needed a hermit guy uh, for a couple chapters, and so I invented this skink character. My, I had my protagonist was running through the woods, or he's lost, or something. And he, I needed a hermit guy. I needed an encounter with a hermit guy. This is literary insight for you. So I sat around. So, so I invented this particular hermit guy. I didn't want him to be just a sort of a standard Hollywood hermit. I wanted him to have an interesting backstory, and I thought Florida politics would do that. 
And uh, as is the case, and it's a wonderful thing when you're with your books, if, when, you're, when a character surprises you and in a good way, and you want to, and all of a sudden, Skink, this weird guy, uh, the former governor Clinton Tyree, um, is saying and doing these things in the, on the page that I didn't expect, things that I wished I had said and done and gotten away with uh, in all my lifetime in Florida. And I, I liked the guy. And, uh, and I so I said, I'd leave him around for a while on, on this little stage in my head. And uh, by and by, he sort of takes over the novel. He becomes really the moral engine of this, no, this strange little novel and, um, and ends up sort of dominating everything. And uh, so I finished the book and I sent it off. I think I'm done with him. You know, that's it. I, I was very pleased. Because a lot of times characters will disappoint you the other way. You have these great uh, hopes and dreams for a character and they just, they really start bumming you out and, you, and you, you've got to get rid of them. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, there's a, I was at a uh, function with Elmore Leonard years ago, the great mystery writer who was a good friend of mine. And uh, he was at a function like this, and somebody who had read every one of his 87 novels uh, raised their hand and said, um, you know, then in this last train to Yuma or whatever, you know, going uh, this, this character, Tex, uh, I love that character. And then in chapter 17, you, you killed him off. Why'd you do that? And, and Dutch just looked down and he goes, well, he was boring me. <laughs> and he said, if he, and if he was boring me, I knew he'd be boring the readers, so I got rid of him. And that's about how complicated it is. It's really true that when you get a character that just sort of, you go, oh, this guy is just dragging everybody down. <laughs> you know, you have, there's a, there's a, he steps in front of a bus, or he, uh, there's some other thing. You gotta get rid of him some way. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there's a lot, uh, there, there are writers who don't do enough of that, who they leave. <laughs> There are characters that the readers are begging for them to, to take a vacation halfway through the book. Or, but anyway, so, but Skink was one of those great characters who just, I just liked him. And then, then I start getting the letters from people, that love, the readers of that book that love him. When are you going to put Skink in another novel? When are you going to put him in? I never thought about really using, I don't have like a Joe Detective guy who keeps coming back. Um, so I hadn't really done that before. And so, uh, but sure enough, I, um, I started dropping him into other novels. And, uh, excuse me a second. And, um, and again, he, was, he proved popular, so I kept, I kept on and on and on. You know, I, I think he's in about a half dozen novels. And at some point, my own youngest son is, became old enough to read the grown-up novels. And uh, he uh, liked Skink, and he thought his buddies would like Skink. And, um, and I thought, well, maybe it's time to stop protecting the youth of America and let this character <laughs> loose. And uh, the way I decided to handle it with this particular book was I had, um, uh, the story is told through the eyes of a kid who's a teenager named Richard, uh, and who ends up, his cousin, uh, sort of a wild child, she um, uh, ends up, running away with a guy she meets on the internet, who turns out not to be who he claims he is. And, uh, and Richard is alarmed, but because she's run away before, the rest of the relatives aren't that alarmed. But Richard is determined, he said he's got to find her, something's wrong. He ends up very improbably in a car racing across the state of Florida with this crazy uh, one-eyed ex-governor uh, scooping up roadkill along the way. And their mission is to find the cousin. And so, but the story is told through Richard's eyes. So Richard gets to edit uh, some of Skink's language. For instance, he has, he has a foul mouth. And when he gets angry, he says a lot of bad words. And you don't have to hear them in this book if it's because it's for kids. Eh? And because Richard just says, you know, then he got mad and started cussing. You know, I, didn't, I don't want to tell you what he said. Uh, and, and it was a nice way to sort of filter out the, the rough edges. Uh, as, as much as was needed, his personality. And I, I just like the idea. Kids love books about adventures. And, 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 and they also like flawed heroes. This is a, the kids of today are much more sophisticated. The, the kinds of books they read today, young, especially in the, in, the, in the young adult or the teen market, much more advanced and sophisticated than anything we, I had to look at in my generation. Um, and so they, can, they, are, they are hip to the fact that sometimes, you know, 
grown-ups aren't perfect. Mom and dad sometimes aren't perfect. And they, so this hero is not a perfect guy. He's far from perfect. He, is, uh, uh, he does and says things. He steps over the edge. But his heart's in the right place. He believes in something. And he believes in particular in the place, the, the, loving the place that he lives. He's passionate about Florida. He gets very hacked off when uh, he sees a, a litter bug, for instance, throw a beer can out the window of a truck. Um, you or I would just say, what a moron. Uh, how can he do that? Skink doesn't, he, that's not in his DNA. He, in, there, he follows the individual uh, to wherever he's going, and, and then a lesson is imparted. Uh, <laughs> so that's just the way he is. Um, and uh, what else? Oh, I wanted to, you know, one of the things I have to also, when I talk to kids about, um, a lot of kids want to know about writing. And the first thing is, how do I become a writer? What do I do? What, and, I, and I say, well, here's the deal. If you do to become a writer, I'll have, I've, the first rule uh, that I tell them is never, ever write about roadkill. Uh, because I very innocently used this little affectation for skin, because I got the idea from a story I'd read about a state trooper in Pennsylvania whose nickname was Officer Roadkill, because every time a deer got hit or a marmot or something, uh, they would call him, and he'd come scoop it up, and he would take it home and eat it. He had a walk-in freezer with all the roadkill. And I thought, well, there's a hobby right there for you. <laughs> so, so I just stole that little thing and gave it that idea to Skink, and I, not thinking anything of it and not realizing at the time, this is one of the hard lessons you learn in, when you're writing. Um, I did not realize that there is an entire uh, 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 very disturbing subculture of roadkill aficionados in this country. And they write letters, and they, s <laughs> they send you recipes. Uh, <laughs> And you like to think, you know, oh, this is a joke, right? And this is just, a, this gets somebody being funny. And then you realize when you start looking at the exact apportionment of, of garlic and cloves that, that they really do, that they do fix possum in that particular matter. And, and it's not, it's very tasty. Um, it's just, it's the raw, again, it stirred up images in my mind of what a sketchy, um, sketchy fan base I have. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the low point of all this came uh, when I was at a book signing in Illinois, and a guy, uh, I see a guy in the back of the line holding something behind him, kind of wa marching towards me. And I was thinking the same thing you are. I'm thinking, oh, God, I, I don't really need it. And, uh, but he, had a, he seemed normal in every other respect. And when he got up in the front of the line, he whirled around and presented me with an oil painting not of a roadkill. <laughs> an original, uh, <laughs> not unfortunately an abstract painting. Uh, and he said, here, I did this just for you in honor of Skink and the Roadkill. So again, you don't know, I mean, I, you, part of the sick part of me is flattered by this. Uh, the, what's left of the normal part of me is horrified by this. <laughs> and uh, I, then I, I started, I went home back to the hotel and I propped it the, the painting facing away from me in the, in the corner somewhere, and at, that night I was thinking, what, what was the process that led this gentleman to do this? Um, was he just sitting in his house, minding his own business, maybe watching the, watching the Bears game on TV or something, and all of a sudden he hears a screech of brakes outside, and he goes rushing out, he grabs his easel, and he grabs his palette. <laughs> He was rushing down to the road because the, the scene is this bucolic two-lane road, blacktop through all these canopy trees, and in the middle of the, right on the center line, is this mushed little fur, uh, this creature. I don't know, it was a beaver, or nutria, or whatever they have up there, uh, wolverine maybe, um, with very, very precisely painted uh, tire treads. If, if I was, if, <laughs> If I was an FBI, CSI guy, I could tell you whether they were Bridgestone or Goodyear or Yokohama, I don't know, but the guy clearly had gotten really up close and personal uh, with the roadkill. And, uh, and it, it, it kept me, I think I might have slept with the lights on that night. Um, uh, so that's, that's my first guy. Whenever I talk to a group of young writers, I stay, stay away from the, the roadkill subject. Um, 
one thing I did, I want to do tonight, and, and what I always do in the groups is take as many questions as I can before I sign some books, and, and it's a little dark, but I, can, I think I can see, and I'll repeat the questions. Uh, well, you're now so grossed out by the roadkill story <laughs> that you aren't going to have any questions, but in case you, you, you do, I'll be, I'm happy to repeat the questions for the, for the audience, especially from kids if, if they're not trembling in their seats by now. No, you are, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> the the, the grown-up books do have the two-word title, and the books for the younger readers had one. That just sort of started by accident, but it does make a little distinction. This book, this title, Skink, No Surrender, I don't write for categories, but as I wrote this book and turned in the pages, they said, well, this is really more of a young, what we call the YA market, a little bit older than, uh, although my, my youngest grandson's nine read it, and he, he thought it was, you know, he had no problem with it, but of course he's you know, he's got my genes, so that's <laughs> scary as that might be. Um, but so this was originally just called Skink. When I turned the manuscript in, that's all I wanted to call it. And they said, no, no, for this market, the teen market, you, gotta, you need a little more on the jacket. You need a subtitle and, you know, and I fought and I, we, we went through a number of subtitles. So this is what we came up with. There's a, I wish I could tell you there was some deep meaning, but I honestly truly have no idea what that me, no surrender. It sounds good, though, right? And so, yeah. So that's what that's what we went with. But I just called it skink and send it in, and the, they sort of decide where it fits and all that. Uh, um, I, yeah, they like one of the reasons for the grown-up novels. They like the two-word title, is because it leaves more room for graphics, um, artwork on the jacket. Um, the more you put on there, the, the the less kind of artistic elements they can put on there. So that's one of the reasons they kind of like that. And, uh, and sometimes I pick the title, and sometimes it's a compromise between, you know, we, we, I come up with a list, and we go through the list. It just depends, you know, it depends on the book. Uh, yes, sir. Well, you always have great music or song references in your books. <laughs> do you put a lot of thought into, are those just I do, I do, I do like to make musical references. I have friends who are musicians, and, um, you know, uh, it's my book. And I, I like put the music I like into it. It's selfish, but I do. I like to do that, and I try to choose something fitting for the moment, or the character, or this, or the scene, you know, uh, and uh, just something that fits, you know. And uh, but yeah, it's, that's one of the great, another one of the selfish pleasures is if I've got to have cultural references at all. I'm not. I probably will not be quoting Justin Bieber in any of my in my books. No offense, but I, I won't be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I stick to the music I like. And, but, and I found that over the years, because I get letters of musicians uh, who are on the road a lot, they, re they read a lot, they've got a lot of time. So I've been very, very lucky to be able to meet a lot of the sort of my uh, m musical idols from my childhood, you know, that are still out and about. And uh, um, it, when the weirdest one of all, at one point I got, the, uh, I got a call from a guy this was a few years ago, a worker who worked for the Grateful Dead, and he said, um, uh, you know, Phil Lesh and Jerry Garcia read your books, they're fans, why don't you come to a concert? And I'd never been to a Dead concert, you know. Uh, I know every, a lot of people go over and over again, but I'd never been to one, so I went, and uh, they put me on the, behind the soundboard. On, so I got to meet everybody, and, you know, it was, it was fun. And, and uh, it's very flattering to know these guys are, are re you know, interested in reading your stuff. And so they put me behind the soundboard on the stage, sitting next to the guy running the board. For the, and, and out in the audience in the Dead concerts, it's just, it was just crazy. Everybody dancing and all kinds of blue smoke uh, in the air. And uh, so I was sitting there, and there was a gentleman over here, an older gentleman on my left, and we struck up a friendship and everything else and, uh, and, and I'm talking to him. And then the sound guy grabs me and drags me off. Side, he says, just stay away from him. And I said, why? why? I said, he said, that's Owsley. And I said, well, who, who's Owsley? Well, like he was the main LSD guy for the entire generation of Haight Ashbury. <laughs> um, uh, and he traveled with the dead as their, I guess, personal pharmacist, you might say. <laughs> And he said, and, and if he gives you something to drink, don't drink it. And that was my advice at the Dead concert. So I said, thank you, Mr. Owsley. I'll stick to the Coca-Cola here. 
But anyway, so that's, that was kind of cool stuff. So yeah, so I throw some musical stuff in there. Yes, young lady. A girl hero. Have I thought? I have thought of it. Um, and I, and the, in every one of the books I do for kids, there's some really strong girl characters. But because I'm a boy, it's hard for me to see through the eyes of, of how a young girl would see. And I had, I mean, I grew up with two sisters in the house. And uh, but, um, yeah, but I, I have. And but in every one of the kids' books, in in, in Hoot, there's a very strong character named Beatrice um, who. Uh, who everyone thinks kind of a, you think she's kind of tough and a little bit of a bully in the first part of the book, but she turns out to be a terrific person. And, and that was sort of a childhood memory of mine too. And, and uh, I, again, you, pu you put those characters on the stage and kind of see how they do and how you're, how you're handling them. And, and so that gave me a little bit of confidence. It would be a good idea. It might be something I try. It might be, because some of the grown up novels, which in 40 years or so you'll be allowed to read. <laughs> Uh, they, the, the main characters are women in those novels. But that's because I think I have, I, I've been lucky as in a, my grown-up life to have known a lot of very, very strong women. Uh, that, and so I could sort of draw those characters a little more crisply, if that makes sense to you. Yes? Um, what kind of books did you read as a kid? Oh, I read, well, when I was a kid, we didn't have a lot of the cool books you have now. So I, I we didn't. I read The Hardy Boys, uh, which was a mystery series. And I, I read a lot of, um, I was a sports nut when I was a kid. I read a lot of sports biographies, like of my baseball heroes, Hank Aaron and Willie Mays and, and Ted Williams and stuff. I mean, I, I read a lot, but I didn't, we didn't have, uh, there wasn't a lot of literature for kids your age when, when I was that age. And um, I mean, there were sort of traditional older kind of books that everyone read, you know, Willy Wonka and that kind of stuff. And I, for whatever reason, stayed away from that stuff, and I went more for the... I, I liked sort of the fast-paced mystery books. I always did, because I wanted... You turn the page, and you couldn't wait, and then, then there was another book in the series, so you ran out, and you got that book from the library. And, um, but that's kind of the stuff I, I read. And I read a lot of newspapers when I was a kid. I mean, we had two newspapers in our house, a, a morning paper, the Miami Herald, and then the Fort Lauderdale News in the evening. And so I, I just, I always loved reading newspapers, and I kind of knew I wanted to be a writer, and I thought that would be a good place to learn about writing. So it, I, that's why I got a newspaper job when I got out of college. Um, but uh, I was lucky, because I knew when I was young what I wanted to do, and I was able to do it. It was pretty cool. Yes, sir. Uh, you have any adult the I do, I do. I, I, when, as soon as I don't really have downtime, so as soon as I finish Skink, I start it up on a, another grow. I'm a grown up novel, but I'm very superstitious about saying much about it. You know, I, I get, I'm one of these, I'm, I'm just paranoid that I've, I've taken the wrong path in it and that I'm just all messed up. And so I don't, I don't say much about it. And what I could tell you about it, I couldn't tell you with these lovely young people. <laughs> Who are here tonight? Um, but uh, it's uh, it's a, it's one of the characters uh, who was in this last novel I did called Bad Monkey, and it's not the monkey. Um, <laughs> uh, so and takes place part of it down in the Keys and elsewhere. So I'm sort of you know fumbling my way through it. But yeah, as soon as I get off the tour, the book tour, I'll I'll be back at it. Yes, ma'am. Oh gosh, that's a good question. Is there a subject that I've wanted to take on and I haven't yet? Well, I, I will probably not in the newspaper column because I, I've done, you know, I've offended everyone there is to offend. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to think of in the novels. Yeah, there probably is. I, but you know, every day you read the, you know, you read the. The papers in Florida, and there's so much material, and you get uh, part of you says, as as as, as a writer of satire, you're just, just you know salivating over over it, but as a citizen with kids and grandkids, it infuriates you and 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 uh, ticks you off so much that yeah, you know, I'm, there's all kinds of targets. It, it's really you have to you find yourself picking the okay, what are the biggest things to do? I mean, but. Yeah, you know, I get inspired by it all the time. I'm sure there's stuff, you know, that I that I haven't done um, because there's always something new. There's a, every 
every new trend of, of um, vice and sleaze begins in Florida, every trend. <laughs> we, if South Florida, this is true, we lead the country in Medicare fraud. We lead the country in identity fraud. Uh, we, uh, we lead the country in mortgage fraud, and we lead the country in foreclosures. Uh, I mean, it, it's just astonishing. So, um, and of course, dope. We lead, uh, excuse me, drugs, narcotics. We lead the country in all that stuff, too. Um, so, you, you know, you, there's just no end to the number of characters that pop up on your radar screen when you're a writer and you just read a little, it can be a five paragraph news story and it, in, there's a novel in there somewhere. You know, that you read it and you go, wait a minute, what if, and that's the game all of, we, we play as novels, what if, and then you just take off like that. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, you've had your hand up a long time, I apologize. As a right, as do I do one no novel at a time, or do I juggle? I only do one at a time. I, I mean, I know a lot of writers who write more. Who do uh, some of them have a stable of writers working for them? Um, <laughs> uh, but I can't. I can't. I can only focus on one thing at a time. And uh, I, especially because, uh, but the kids' books alternating is is good. I mean, it gives me a little bit of a. Uh, a break and the, you know there, there's enough of a difference in, in, in the rhythm and the pacing of the books and the kids books that I, I, I do get a little breather from it but I I don't I, I do not I can't even conceive of trying to work in more than one book at once I mean it would the, the work would suffer it absolutely would suffer um, I envy them I mean I admire them for having that ability to have all this stuff going at once but it's too much like a factory for me, I mean, I, I, I just agonize over sentences and fret about adjectives and, you know, I rework dialogue 50 times before I get it right. I mean, I, it's just my process isn't like that. I, I'm not working from an outline, so I have no idea where the books are going. And I have no formula, so it's just, I'm winging it. It's like on a tight ride, you know, the whole time for me, so I couldn't possibly do more than one. Yes, sir? Being music city, I have to return to music. Uh, on your web Side, uh, of, among the links that you have, there's a link to Jimmy Buffett's yes. Margaritaville <laughs> and Warren Zevon. Yes. Could you elaborate on your friendship? Well, the, these are two examples. Um, I'll start with Warren Zevon, who was an incredible rock and roll performer and writer and a, and a wild person in the old days and excitable boy and werewolves of London and all that stuff. And he had he is a prolific reader, very intelligent, uh, you know, I'm one of these off the chart IQ guys. And he, and he, I had mentioned his music, which I had liked since I was a kid in, a, in one of my novels. And he showed up at a book signing in LA and uh, just showed up and he had a very deep voice and I'm signing books and he's approaching and, and, I, and he said to me, I'm Warren Z, I shook his hand and, and I didn't know whether he was going to, what he was going to do because if he didn't, I, did, I knew I'd heard the stories and I didn't know if he did, if he didn't like the, what I wrote, then I was in trouble. He, he just said, do you want to have coffee afterwards? And I said, okay, we went and had coffee and we t sat there for like two hours and he was completely clean and sober at this point in his life and he, um, we talked about writing. What he wanted to talk about was writing, the language, the love of language, the rhythm of a, uh, of a, a line of a lyric or, uh, and that's where we came from. He said, you know, we ought to do some songs sometimes. And, you know, he said, if I send you some song ideas, can you do some, you want to do some lyrics? So we ended up doing three songs together. It was, uh, it was well, the first one we did was a song called Seminole Bingo. And, and it was because Warren had played this joint in Lauderdale and he stayed at a hotel. And I was waiting for him in the lobby and he came down. In those days in Florida, the hotels, they had racks and racks of tourist brochures. You know, where you picked them, you picked them, oh, I want to go see this one. So there was, and he picked one up, and it was for Seminole Bingo. This was before the Seminole tribe had the full casinos. It was Bingo. And he, and he just looked at it, and he had that way, and he cocked He said, that'd be a great title for a song, Seminole Bingo. And he stuffed it in his jacket. And we did that one. We did a song called Rottweiler Blues. Um, <laughs> And then we did a song called Basket Case, as he did it as a favor to me because of the novel. And uh, we did that one together. So that was the greatest experience of my life. And, I, and I, he was a dear, dear friend to me and uh, a fantastic writer. And when he did die, all the people that did tributes to him, Bob Dylan, uh, Springsteen, 
Petty, everybody in rock and roll, Bonnie Raitt, everybody loved his stuff and had, had either covered it at one point or so. But Warren was a good, good, good friend. And then Jimmy Buffett, when Tourist Season, which is the first novel I ever wrote by myself, um, came out in 86, I got a, and I, I knew Jimmy's work, I was a fan of Jimmy's, and he, he called me from LA and uh, where he was for some reason, and he wanted, he wanted to option the rights, the movie rights to, to the book, and they'd already been, Paramount or somebody had already had the movie rights to that, to that book. But we talked on the phone, we became friends, and the next time when he was back in Key West, uh, he called me and we went and we just started talking, and it was the same thing, we just, you know, we, we, he loves to fish, and you know, Florida in common and everything else, so we've just been friends a long, long time. And, uh, and speaking of this particular book, he called me at one point and said, can you come down to Key West to the studio, uh, uh, which was on the shrimp docks, the old shrimp docks in Key West, if you've ever been there. And he said, I want you to hear something. And so I said, sure. And I was living in the Keys at the time. And I drove down and uh, go in the studio. And he plays this song. And it was based on the main character in Tourist Season, this crazed, I know, far-fetched, an insane newspaper columnist who was named Skip Wiley. So the name of the song was The Ballad of Skip Wiley. And, and it, Jimmy had done it. And in the song, he mentions Skink, who's not in that book, but he mentions him as well. And I, it was just blew me away. I mean, it was a pretty cool thing to have one of your music heroes do that. And they needed to, there was some part of that song, and I, I, it's been a long time since I remember it, but it was on an album called Barometer Soup. But at the beginning, they needed a bunch of co sounds of cocktail glasses clinking together, or some sort of people drinking and having a good time. I know, odd for a Buffett song, right? <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> So we were, I had me, that was my contribution, was holding like a, some sort of margarita glass and, and, you know, toasting someone else and making party noises. He knew better than to let me sing, so that's, that's what uh, we did. But it was very cool and nice. I mean, we've been, we've been uh, good friends. We go fishing together sometimes still. But, but you know, these, this is what I'm saying. It's one of the great perks of, of it's something you don't think about when you write the book. You really don't think about, you send a novel off, you don't think, what, famous people are going to read this or, or people, you know, would care. you don't, I really think about, you know, how's my family going to react or how's my, are my kids going to like it. I don't ever think in the cosmic terms or, or what actor would play this role or, or do that. I've never done that. So it's always kind of a kick when uh, um, I never, <laughs> yeah, I got a, I get a, uh, an email one day from, uh, David Crosby, Crosby Stills. David Crosby's got an interesting history too, but he's a very sweet, good person, and he, he's a maniacal reader. He reads everything, and he'd read all the novels, and he just wanted me to come to a show so he could meet me. And I said, "Yeah, I think I can swing that. I'll stop by and make time for you, David." <laughs> but anyway, that's the sort of thing. I'm just like, who would ever dream that, you know? Um, so that's, I've been lucky. I've been lucky that way. But again, I will say this: that all that, all that aside. The most amazing um, thing for me has been getting the letters from the kids when I started doing these kids' books um, because I, I just was not used to, you know, that kind of... A, when I was a kid and I read a book I liked, truly the farthest thing from my mind would have been to sit down and write a letter to an author. I would have never thought of that. And uh, they write you these letters and they tell you these stories and, uh, and, and they tell you how they connect and, and I'm amazed because I'm writing about Florida, and, but they can be writing with me from, you know, Norman, Oklahoma. But they've had some experience that, they, that resonates with something they've read. And it's a very, uh, very cool thing. And sometimes it's very, very touching. I, I had a character in a, a kid, one of the kids' books called Chomp, whose, um, whose home was uh, about to be taken away by the bank if, his, if the dad didn't you know, come up with some money. They've, they'd fallen on rough times. This was after, you know, the big recession and everything else. And, um, and he, they were helping out their father, trying to make some extra money. So, and, and the book goes on. That was just one little backstory for one of the characters. But a, a little boy wrote me from somewhere, and I wish I could remember where it was. And he tells me how much he liked the book. It's funny. He had a great time. He says, and I really identified with the main character because the bank is trying to take our house away right now. And just, whoa, it just, cr you know, uh, crushes you. But through all that, he sat down to write me this great letter. So that's why I keep writing those books. It has nothing to do with anything except that it's a very, 
I can't, turn, you know, I can't say no to those kids, you know. I mean, I, you know, you, you don't want to disappoint them. They want another book, I'll do another a book for them. And, uh, it, but it's, it, it really makes you stop and think about why you become a writer in the first place. And that's to, really is to touch people and to make them, you know, to, and especially if you can give them a laugh or two, which I try to do in my novels. This is a, we live in a, an age where we, 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 all of us need a laugh almost every day if you read the news. You need to at least smile at something. So it, uh, it's important. It's good to hear from people like that. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Do you have time to read now? And if you do, what do you read? That's a good question. I think a lot of writer novelists will tell you that the great, uh, the great sadness is you don't have much time to do reading. And I, I, uh, I try not to read fiction when I'm in the middle of writing a book. I do, I do it on purpose because I don't want to be unconsciously infected or affected by another writer's style. Um, it, it can throw you off your game. Uh, so I try not to. I do read some and I get sent books uh, that in advance, advanced copies of books from friends and things and and you know you feel an obligation they, because they want you know something for the jacket, some nice comment and all that or, or from a publisher or editor that I know says this is really a great book and then once in a while uh, it really is a great book and I'm thrilled that they sent it to me. Uh, sometimes it, you're in a situation where it's an okay book, but you feel obliged. You know, so uh, I don't, uh, the, what I'm saying is what I end up reading is not sometimes what I, I choose to read. It's just like, oh gosh, this is a nice person and they want me to look at the book. You know, and, and, and I, I, I wish I had more time. To, I, when I read the most probably is on airplanes and when I'm not homework, because I'm not working then and I'm not working on the column or anything. So. I try to use the travel time to, to do the reading. I wish I, there's a stack, a big stack of books on the nightstand and, and um, I did read, you know, like for instance, uh, I just read the new Martin Amos book that was sent to me in galleys, not for a blur, but just because uh, I follow his stuff pretty closely. So I made some time to read that, it's kind of an overpowering book, but he's a very gifted writer. So I, I sort of made time over one of the holiday breaks to do that. Uh, you're all, that's it? Yeah, I know there's, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, have you ever had a, someone come after you for defamation or anything else because they thought they were one of the characters? No, have I ever had, have I ever had anyone come after me because they thought they were one of the characters? Never. No, I don't, the only thing that's come up, it's been with this skink character where there were at least three former governors of Florida. <laughs> That's true, who would tell people that they were skink. <laughs> if you've read the grown-up books, you, doesn't that make you, it sort of reinforces my view that politicians can be somewhat detached from reality. Uh, there was never a governor like this. Florida would have been a better place if there was. But they, they understood that he'd become sort of this folk hero and kind of character in Florida, so they would tell people, oh yeah, that's the highest and all that after me, and I, I wanted to wring their necks, but I mean, in the end I just laughed and, you know, and laughed it off, but that's the only time, and that isn't defamation, it, it, it was reverse defamation of me, it was what it was defamation of, <laughs> that I would do something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, but no, I've never, in the newspapers, uh, I've, in the newspaper there's only been, <laughs> Truly, only one lawsuit in all the years, and it was filed by the mayor of Miami at the time. Of course, it was a public figure, and, and is, uh, you, they don't win lawsuits like this because I write a, an opinion column. And, and uh, so I had taken to calling him Mayor Loco, and uh, in the column, Mayor Loco, in, because he was be, he was behaving in a, in a uh, what I perceived to be a, a clinically deranged fashion. <laughs> Not a doctor, just my personal opinion. I mean, he'd shown up in the, in the lobby of the Miami Herald building one morning in his bathrobe. <clears throat> you know, if, if, it's cute if, you're, if that's Bill Cosby doing it. It's, it's not cute when it's the mayor of the city doing it. Um, and because he just wanted a, an early copy of a paper that he thought was something bad was going to be said about him in one of the Herald. You know, that kind of nutty stuff. <clears throat> he had... Um, this was after he, had, he was out campaigning in a section of town that was pretty tough. 
And uh, <clears throat> he was just like barging up to people's doors. And this was about nine at night in Miami, which <laughs> banging on the door saying, this is Mayor Suarez, this is Mayor Suarez, I want to talk to you about the election. And <laughs> this is a true story, there was a, an elderly woman minding her own business, you know, watching the Golden Girls or whatever on TV, and this guy pounding on her door. She runs and gets a 38 caliber revolver, which is a perfectly normal reaction in Miami. We're all trained to do that. This is part of what we, and she stands at the door and says, go away, go away, I don't, no, it's the mayor. Goes, I'm gonna shoot through this door in about two seconds. He goes, oh, so he, he was whisked away, but there were reporters there at the time. So, but that's the, so I just started affectionately calling him Mayor Loco, and so he filed some lawsuit that was thrown out in about 32 seconds. Um, but uh, that was, wasn't even a real lawsuit. And he was, he's a Harvard Law graduate, too. That was the, that was the other thing. He should have known, he should have maybe studied harder. He would have known that you know, it wouldn't have happened. Um, but I was somewhat redeemed in his eyes uh, later because um, the publisher of our newspaper at the time was a, a very nice and good gentleman uh, named David Lawrence. And, uh, but he, was, he could do some things that just didn't, and he wanted the whole community to love him. He wanted, he was like the kumbaya guy in a town that was not that way. And uh, at some point he decided, he said, he announced in his op-ed column on the Sunday page of the Miami Herald that he was thinking about running for governor of Florida, the publisher of a newspaper. So I started referring to him as Publisher Loco in the column. <laughs> and uh, Mayor Loco actually felt better about me after that. <laughs> Dave did not like it, but it, it, uh, it's a measure of the newspaper that I was able to do it and write it and put it in. Not very many papers would have let a columnist do that. Um, so, um, you know, that's why I still work there. They don't mess, they don't mess with me. And, uh, and, by, and I'm not bragging, it's just that after so many years, I'm, I'm, I was, you know, I've been doing it since most of these people who are running the place were, were born since then now, and so they just, they just stay away. Also, they don't, they don't want their fingerprints on the column. Oh, that's another Hyacinth column. Okay, you want to take that? No, you go ahead and take it. So it's nice, they just stand away from it. Like toxic, you know? Um, you all have been terrific, and uh, if, if, uh, if there aren't any more questions, I, oh yes, there's one, I'm sorry. Hi, sir. Will I write a, would I write a memoir? Oh, the downhill lie, oh my God. This is a book she's referring to that I wrote about golf, a, a nonfiction book. This was the most, this is truly the most, probably the scariest and most uh, demented of all the books I've ever written because it was, every word was true. Uh, after 32 years, I'd given up golf when I was a kid after, and, and, and kind of after my dad passed away. And, uh, and so for 32 years, I, I didn't play golf. And, uh, and then I, and, and one of my friends from high school and I reconnected there's a lesson in this, by the way. Uh, if, if you do hear from a friend after 30 years, maybe you know. And he said, come on, let's play. We've been, let's go play golf like we did, you know, back in the day. And so I started, I took it up again, started playing it again. And I just started keeping this diary. And it was a terrible, terrible time in my life. Um, the only way that I was rescued from golf, which isn't in the book because it happened afterwards, is that I hurt my back. And I haven't been able to play. but. Uh, at one point, I sunk a golf cart, uh, and I thought everybody in Florida, I mean, I just thought, oh, well, I'm sure this happens all the time, because all the courses have lakes and ponds, and I'd, I'd hit a ball down by the water, and I'd parked on the side of a hill, and the, and the brake, I thought, was set, and I went down to look at my golf ball, and I hear something coming down the hill in my direction. It's a golf cart, and this is a lake, you know, there's gators, there's water moccasins, all that stuff. And I don't care about any of that. All I care about is I got a brand new set of golf clubs on the back of that golf cart. So I, so I jump on like it's some sort of stagecoach. I throw myself on the back of this thing. And as the, as the thing is going under, I, I unstrap my Callaways and I heave them back up on the bank. I rescue the Callaway, of course, I'm in the water. And then I jump out and I watch. And all it's now you see is like the little top of the golf cart. And I, and, and I, and I throw my cell phone up too, so I call the call the, you know, the clubhouse. And I said, yeah, I'm out on like 15 West and uh, I'm sorry, I sunk one of your golf carts. I, you know, I said, you want to, maybe you should send out whoever you send out to pull the golf carts out of the, and there's a long pause and the guy says, 
uh, you know, we've been open 50 years and we never had anyone sink a golf ball. <laughs> so now, he, and I said, I said, well, God, do you want me to wait or keep playing? He says, keep playing. So I take, I'm, everything's wet, so I take off my shoes and I'm playing barefoot all by myself. I'm walking, dragging my clothes. And I come around the other backside of the course, the backside of the same lake. And there's a Jeep Cherokee, four-wheel drive, and some guy's sullenly sitting in it. He's got a chain hooked up <laughs> into the, to the golf, and I see him dragging the golf cart out of the, out of the water. Oh, my God, it was just this most horrible thing I ever did. <laughs> it's terrible. And, and I asked, I asked call, calling my friends who've been playing golf their whole lives, and I said, you, you sunk a cart, haven't you, before? You, Are you out of your mind? How do you sink a golf cart? So, Anyway, that's the sort of, but no, no more memoirs for me. That, that, was, that was it. That was, all, that was too much confession right there. So, but anyway, I, my life is not, is not that interesting. So um, anyway, you've all been terrific. I will see you. I'm not sure where I'm signing. Ken? Ken's going to save me. Anyway, I'll see you wherever I'm signing. Thank you.